Hey everyone, it's Samuel. And I'm Ashley Warren. And welcome to Plot Hooks, the podcast where we explore the arts of narrative and collaborative storytelling in the world's premier RPG, Dungeons and Dragons. Today in the Prime Material, a deep dive into storytelling. In the wilds, imps. And in the tavern, what would you do if you rolled back time? Well, thank you very much for joining us, Ashley. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. We genuinely appreciate it. We've been wanting to have you on for a while. And if you'd just like to take a moment to introduce yourself, I I can look up and see lots of different things to say about you, but like they're so varied and so widespread. Just I'll just give you the floor and, and see what all you want to share about the many projects that you do in the TTRPG world and beyond. Sure. I feel like that's that's pretty accurate. I've had a, a pretty eclectic creative career so far in my life. Uh, so yeah, I'm Ashley, and I am a writer, a narrative designer, and I'm also a mentor for fellow creatives. I am the founder and director of the Storytelling Collective, which was formerly called the RPG Writer Workshop. I also run my own company called Scribe Mine, which is just a one-woman creative agency where I develop resources for writers and creatives. And I am a co-author of Icewind Dale, Rime of the Frostmaiden. I also am the lead author of Hecna by Hitpoint Press. And I've worked on, at this point, probably dozens of TTRPG projects <laughs> in the community and industry. So that's, that's me in a nutshell, basically doing anything that has to do with collaborative storytelling and narrative design and also helping other people get started in those uh, creative endeavors. And we look forward to diving into those subjects today. Um, Before we get into the Prime material, just a couple of announcements to get out of the way. Of course, remember always to follow us on social media. You can find us at Plot Hooks on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And wherever you happen to be listening to the podcast today, if you could kindly give it a rating and review, it helps spread the word about Plot Hooks to more people. Also on the realm of social media, our quest for 1K is still going on, and we're currently, I think, 26 followers away from our next milestone and our next giveaway, which is live there on our Twitter account, so be sure to check us out there. Special announcement regarding Disaster Hamsters. As you know, that is our next uh, supplement coming out on the DMs Guild, the story of a bunch of hamsters uh, escaping the laboratory of the nefarious Jerry Heliod. That is currently this week in the midst of external playtesting. The first playtest is actually this evening as we record this. So we're getting closer and closer to actually being able to release this to everyone, and we're so excited to share this with all of you. Uh, finally, if you could take a minute to go over and to our Patreon and check that out, if that would be something that you would like to do, if you'd love to give back to the show, it helps us keep the lights on around here and keep producing more and more content for you all each and every day. But with those announcements out of the way, uh, let's dive into our main topic. As I mentioned earlier, We've wanted to have you on for a while because, as you can tell, even if you are unfamiliar completely with Ashley's work from just her brief introduction and of the things that she does, uh, this passion of collaborative storytelling is something that uh, we both share a lot. It's at the core, it's what the Plot Hooks Creative Network is all about between our podcasts and our supplements and, and stuff like that. We're all about the art of collaborative storytelling and trying to instill confidence in the next generation of storytellers. That's just the angle that we take on things, even whenever we're 
covering nitty gritty stuff like subclasses or various other mechanical aspects of role playing, we always want to key in on how we can use these aspects to tell fascinating stories. So we thought, what better way to get some really interesting and unique perspective from a, a professional in that realm than to, to have Ashley on? I guess the first place to start is just initially what drew you into storytelling to begin with? What, what was fascinating about the storytelling process, whether that was initially with uh, role-playing storytelling or, or, with, or whether that was storytelling through another medium. What drew you into that first off? Sure. So I can't really think of a time in my life where stories haven't been just a huge part of my identity. I learned how to read at a really young age. I guess the family lore is that I taught myself how to read when I was like three. And I've just always been drawn to books, especially. And I just loved reading. And so I really credit my love of reading with wanting to be a writer because I think it's really hard to be so passionate about reading and books and then mm. not want to try that yourself. And so I feel like for me, Becoming a storyteller was something that I knew would be kind of my life's purpose. And I know that sounds kind of like a lot to say of, you know, what I thought about as a young child, but it's it's really true. I just knew kind of instinctively early on in my life that I wanted to be a storyteller in some capacity. I didn't necessarily have dreams to be a novelist or something like that. I just knew that in some way I wanted to make stories an important part of my life and hopefully professionally. And for me, that also was balanced with wanting to work with other storytellers. So I've always had a passion for research and education that are, is kind of like the other two pillars of what I consider to be like my identity, which is very much writing research and education. And so for me, all of those really fit together because I think stories are just so important. They give my life meaning. And I think a lot of people also feel that way. And it's not enough for me to just enjoy stories on their own. I want to tell stories with other people and empower other people to tell their stories. And so I really think it's just something that I've loved from childhood. And I especially love collaborative storytelling and, you know, experiences like Dungeons and Dragons because of that collaborative communal aspect to it. And so I I don't know, I've always just wanted to explore different types of storytelling. I'm really passionate about, you know, of course, traditional writing, which is what my uh, background is in. Mm -hmm. I was an English major, of course, and I went on to study uh, literacy studies in graduate school so that I could have kind of the other aspect of that, which was helping other people develop a passion for reading and writing. And I don't know, ever since then, I've just, I've just loved storytelling. I can't imagine my life as anything other than being so storytelling focused, because I think it's it's not just a frivolous endeavor to be a storyteller. I think it really matters, especially in this day and age. So that's kind of my my big picture answer of my life's purpose as as a storyteller. Sure. Yeah, I, I know for a while there, your Twitter header was uh, the the neon sign of that quote where it says, we're all made of stories. And, mm -hmm. and that, that seems to really jive with who you are as an individual and, and what you enjoy doing for a, a living and just as a passion. Yeah, absolutely. And I really like that neon sign. I just changed it to another sign about the Mandalorian because that's where yeah. my headspace is right now, <laughs> uh, which I mean, is also goes back to just my love for storytelling. I really love to get really deeply invested in stories and lore. And especially now as our world continues to struggle with COVID, uh, having those creative outlets has been really important for me. And so I've just kind of been going all in on the stories that, you know, make me happy and make me think. And it's it's really nice to always have something like that in our lives. And that's really why I love to read. I love to watch movies and TV shows and really just invest myself into stories and stories of all kinds. So I feel like that that kind of fits, even though my, my current geek obsession is, you know, Star Wars, which is my <laughs> a phase I go through every few years. So I guess that's pretty <laughs> typical for me. Uh, we're currently in the middle of that phase as well. We're going through the movies and Clone Wars with my mm -hmm. uh, with my six year old. So we're uh, we are in in the middle of that. I just bought her an Ahsoka shirt that says uh, 
Um, you don't have to look tough to be tough. So it's uh, we're it, we're we're head deep in that phase as well currently in our household. <laughs> yes, I love that, and I think you know especially for for girls like there's so many inspirational characters in Star Wars, and it's just fun. But I feel like Star Wars is just one of many kind of fandoms that I've been involved in, in in my creative life and just kind of personal geek life. And it's fun to always have new stories that are coming out of those universes. Yeah. And it's, it's quite interesting when you see how different types of storytelling mediums, whether it's the official releases of various fandoms like Lord of the Rings or Star Wars or any of the other intellectual properties. There's so much there that people love to engage with, with those stories. And so much so that there's a big aspect of those communities about writing and developing your own stories or or trying to fill in the gaps of the stories where something is left ambiguous to try to figure out exactly where this character was at this particular time in this particular instance because it's not explicitly mentioned uh, there's so much fascination that we all have with storytelling but then whenever you look at the specific medium of tabletop role-playing games it almost takes another step forward where you're not just engaging with primarily content which is produced by another. You're actually enjoying and and being enthralled with the collaborative process where you are both the storyteller and the audience at once around a table with your friends. What is it about this specific medium of TTRPGs that just seems to really capture the imagination of so many versus these other creative storytelling outlets. Yeah, I think that, I mean, you kind of already touched on this, but it's it really comes down to this difference between active participation and passive participation. So whenever Hmm. we engage with stories, there's always some level of it being active because reading, you know, is an activity. And so is watching something and and thinking critically about things. But when you are playing a tabletop game, it really is active in a new way because you're the storyteller and you're driving the story forward and you're making active decisions based off of the knowledge that you have. And so it really does require you to be active in a way that other creative mediums don't necessarily offer. And that's Hmm. what I think is one aspect of why that's that's so appealing for so many people and I think it really comes down to it being a really truly immersive medium because you don't just get to you know read about these worlds and these adventures you are the worlds and these adventures you get Mm. to create your characters and drive forth this story that has not existed until you are telling it with your friends at the table and I think that there's just something so powerful about that and it doesn't even really matter what the game itself is it's just the story that you're telling together and Mm. I think especially for people who are already interested in you know geek stories and, you know, fantasy and science fiction and those kind of big epic stories. There's nothing more fun than being part of those big epic stories and actually kind of living through those. Like, I always feel that the games that I've played in the past and the characters that I've played, those memories become part of my own memories. So Mm -hmm. obviously they're separate because, you know, it's fiction and it's make-believe and it's characters who aren't necessarily me, but it's still experiences that I've lived with and have, uh, you know, done with my friends at the table. And so it does become real in that sense in a way that just reading a great book doesn't become real. So I think that that's really what that's draws. That's what draws me to it. And I think that's really what draws other people to it as well. Yeah, that aspect of memory is is a real key one for me. Whenever you're you're reading a book or watching a movie and you are engaging with your memory as you're taking in what's happening and taking in this, oh, that's a fascinating lore. Oh, that's a fascinating twist. That's an awesome thing. And you're taking all that into your head. But the active participation is a whole new way of engaging with your memory because you're actually... Even though, as you mentioned, it is a separate character, you are actually making new memories 
as the story is being told, the story is unfolding in your memory at the same time that it's unfolding in real life. And there just seems to be a real engagement with this type of of storytelling, which is we've we've seen the big Dungeons and Dragons boom over the last five years. I think I think that's just a real big reason why is people have discovered that engaging actively is so much more fulfilling at times than engaging passively. Right. And I think that even when you are playing a game like D&D online, there's still this element of it being an analog experience where you're actually talking with your friends, you're interfacing with them, you you might have, you know, the books or the resources. And so in a way, it's this, it's this active activity that's a little bit different than playing a video game, although, of course, there are some similarities there in the participation required. But I think that also kind of appeals to people that there's something a little bit like simplified and stripped down about playing a tabletop game where you don't have to have a ton of technology or items or or gear to just play a game with your friends and tell a really great immersive story. And so I think that's also really appealing about it. Like, of course, you can go down the rabbit hole of you know buying expensive dice and all of that, but you really don't need <laughs> anything to just start a story together. And I think that's really powerful. Absolutely. Now, when you're... DMing or being part of the cast of a story, of a collaborative TTRPG story, what are the things that you are sure to include as you're actually crafting a a potential narrative? Whether it's just writing something for your, your home group, or writing a backstory for a personal character, or writing something for sale, which is going to be used by a ton of different DMs, which, you know, we have no idea or have ever met. What are the things which you find necessary to actually include in that writing in order to facilitate the collaborative storytelling of others? Yeah, I think that it's a little different writing for your own home group than it is writing for, you know, a much larger audience. But for me, I try to always factor in different types of role play and different types of game play into anything that I write and produce, including for my own home game. So that means that I am trying to always consider different types of characters and what their goals are. And so I wouldn't necessarily write only combat heavy stories or only role play heavy stories or only, you know, heists or, you know, stealth related stories. I try to have a mix of that in, you know, as many things as, you know, as many adventures that I can produce just so that I can really make sure that I am offering a fun opportunity for any type of player. Because as game designers, we can't really predict what kinds of characters people are going to play when they play our content. And so all Mm -hmm. we can really do is try to craft memorable, unique experiences that kind of touch on the different aspects of role play. And I think in D&D, the the three pillars idea is really helpful for me. So that's like the, the social, the environmental, and the combat. And that basically means that if you can have an element of each of those in your adventure, that's pretty well rounded, and you're kind of touching on each of those notes. So that's something that I try to keep in mind when I'm DMing as well, because not all of my players like the exact same things and they want Mm -hmm. different things from each of our sessions. So that just keeps it dynamic and fresh and makes sure that everyone gets a chance to shine because I think that's also important is that as a DM, I want my players to have fun and feel like their characters have made a difference and achieve their goals. And of course, you know, they have to work for that and be strategic about that. But my goal as a DM is not to prevent them from doing that. It's to encourage mm. them to do that and facilitate exactly. a story that lets them accomplish that. Yeah. I love the phrase that the DM is not the writer of the story, is not the storyteller. The DM is the steward of the story. They're presenting the correct uh challenges and roadblocks in the way of the party in order to give them an opportunity to tell a great story together so we're all working together in order to craft a narrative not just the dm railroading in a specific thing in order to essentially just become the storyteller with live NPCs that they're kind of controlling in a roundabout way. 
Right. And I think that as, and actually I saw an interesting discussion about this recently on Twitter about, is there like a better name for the dungeon master? And someone was like, well, what about storyteller? Which I'm not really against because it is technically a storytelling role. But as you said, it's not just, you're not the only one telling the story. It's everyone's telling the story. And then other people suggest a narrator, which I kind of like as well, because that's kind of how I see myself as a DM is that I am a facilitator. I really like the word steward. So I think that that's a really good way to think about it or kind of a guide because you're basically just providing the parameters of a story. And then what actually happens in that narrative is up to the players. So, I mean, at some point it might be a little pedantic, but it's nice to kind of talk through why we call that role different words and what those words mean when we're playing a game with, you know, our friends at the table. Sure. Absolutely. And whenever we're talking about a more broader picture when you're talking about the the creation aspect which uh you've obviously been involved in uh, a ton of creating content for others to use products that give other dms the tools to tell their own stories within uh, a pre-built narrative so to say what do you see that our role as storytellers is when we're producing things for others? In many ways, writers are kind of the first collaborators in the collaborative story because they're producing stuff which is then taken and worked by the DM, and then that is taken and changed by the players, and everything works together to create a cohesive narrative whole. But unlike the rest of those collaborators, we're not also the audience. So in in that sense, we're not really collaborating with the end goal. So what do you see our role is and how does that change our storytelling writing whenever we're doing something for somebody else? Sure. Well, I think as writers, in a way, we are always part of the audience for our work because I personally only write projects that I think are cool. And so (laughs) I only, you know, the stories that I write are things that I'm genuinely interested in. And so my, I'm always thinking about the outcome of the story, but it's usually just from my perspective. I don't think that it's our duty as game designers and narrative designers to predict anything that will possibly happen with our adventures. It's just impossible to do that. So all we can really do is provide Dungeon Masters with a good framework for a story and a narrative arc. And I think that providing a narrative arc is different than railroading. We still need to Mm -hmm. give Dungeon Masters a beginning, middle, and end of an adventure so that they know like this is what the planned arc is of the story. Now, how that plays out is what the players do, of course. And so your goal isn't to say there's only one way to accomplish this. It's to say, here's what the story is. And here's all the different ways that your players might be able to accomplish the specific goal or outcome. And so as designers, we always have to be thinking about the different outcomes and try to give DMs as much help as we can with that and to give them the tools, which means give them, you know, the setting and the characters and the motivations uh, to actually play that out. But it's not really our job to give, you know, an infinite amount of outcomes. We just can't do that. But every sure. every published adventure and module has a full story. Like that's part of the, that's part of our job as storytellers to write collaborative experiences that have a story because I think we leave DMs floundering when we don't give them enough, you know, specific information. But it's always with the assumption that when you take this to your table, you're going to make it your own. And so you can do whatever you want with this story and content. Here's just the general framework and here's how I as the writer have envisioned it. And then once it's yours, it's yours. And I'm not very precious with that as a writer. I know that my games and experiences are whatever tables want them to be. And so I just know that I will write what I think is a cool story and include unique elements and try to hit on those three pillars. And then after that, it's kind of, it belongs to someone else besides me, which is something I find really satisfying about writing for this audience that is a little bit different than writing, you know, traditional fiction content, which has just one clear outcome is that it's kind of this 
this ongoing conversation that you give Mm -hmm. them the starting point, then they take it and make something new out of it. And it's always fun when groups tell you, you know, how they've played your adventure, because then that's a new element of the conversation. And then another group that plays your adventure does something totally different and so on and so forth. So that's kind of how I think of it as like, this is the starting point of this conversation. But once it's out there, it grows into something new. And that's really special. Absolutely. As you've been working more and more and more in this industry and and moving further along in your career, what do you think is a a valuable lesson that you've learned about the collaborative storytelling process that maybe wasn't intuitive at first? Sure. I, I mean, I think of this as both a writer, but also just, you know, a player in the games that I play and just knowing that you're not the only hero in your story, especially mm. in a D&D game or, you know, something where there are heroes, that it's this is a communal experience. And so you can't really be too stuck on making yourself kind of the center point of everything. And I think that also is applicable for being a creative in a creative community. Like it's not my goal or aspiration to be the most successful person in my community. My goal is to make cool stuff and then help other people make cool stuff. And so I think that also kind of goes to, you know, the philosophy of playing at a table, like designing characters that are really cool and unique and special, but not so much that it's taking anything away from my fellow players and to always just have that element of respect that everything that we're doing is to enjoy with other people. And so we shouldn't be too stuck on how we see ourselves because everyone's the hero of their own story, of course. But what I think is more fun is when we can really bond with fellow creatives and, you know, players and, you know, develop cool new experiences together. So that's kind of, I guess, a high level answer, but that's really how I approach all of my creative work is that it's not so much about my own goals and aspirations. It's just, you know, putting positive things out into the universe and hoping that my community will enjoy it and trying to pay it forward where I can. Yeah, that's great. Well, before we finish with the prime material for today, um, uh, I know you mentioned a couple of things about what you do with uh, the uh, Storytelling Collective and ScribeMind and, and various other things like that, um, especially with the, the Storytelling Collective. Um, why don't you uh, plug that a little bit? Because that is an amazing and awesome resource. Tell us a little bit about what what that project is and how you're uh, helping out with the uh, wider TTRPG community. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So the Storytelling Collective was founded in uh, summer 2018, originally as the RPG Writer Workshop. At that point, I had been producing DD content like pretty uh, regularly. I had actually started publishing in December 2017. And then at this point, I was on a roll of like publishing, I think at least an adventure a month for like six months in a row and on Dungeon Masters wow. Guild. And I was just like, I was so into it. I was really inspired. I was really excited about just the potential for that community. And I was also getting a lot of new opportunities at that time, which was exciting. And so people kept reaching out to me asking like, how do I write? an adventure. And so I was giving, you know, everyone kind of the same spiel through email and giving them some pointers. And I realized like the community could really benefit from a more uh, organized educational effort because there really is a high demand for people who want to write adventures, especially mm-hmm. because there are platforms like Dungeon Masters Guild and Drive Through RPG and itch.io that, you know, encourage creators to basically publish their own games as independent creators. And so I had put together just kind of a like an email series, an educational email series. And I thought it was going to be, you know, a small group of people and more than 500 people signed up. And I was like, <laughs> okay, well, this clearly is something that people would like. And so I then took it a lot more seriously and developed it out into a full educational program. And that's what the RPG Writer Workshop was has been for the past few years. And so we have our flagship Write Your First Adventure course, which is exactly what it sounds like. We help people write their very first adventure with the goal of publishing that to DM Guild or Drive Through RPG or wherever they like. And what's been great is that Hundreds of people from our community have gone on to publish adventures and get really amazing opportunities out of that, many of whom now work professionally in the tabletop industry. And we decided late last year to rebrand the Storytelling Collective because, I mean, basically touching on what we were just talking about, just the communal aspects of storytelling are so Mm -hmm. varied and it does go beyond tabletop role play. 
And so we wanted to provide more resources to our community that might not be as specific to tabletop, but still kind of adjacent to that. And so it just felt time to kind of update our our identity, but we still certainly plan to focus on tabletop content. We have quite a few new courses in the works for that. And we will have our Write Your First Adventure course again in July. And that's always like such a fun, like, time of the year. We do it in July and November. We actually have a Write Your First Encounter workshop that we're developing for the spring. And really our goal is to help break down the barriers for people getting started because I don't really believe in telling someone to just start when you're learning a creative endeavor. I remember someone told that to me when I was trying to learn how to knit and I was like, okay, that's nice, (laughs) but I don't know what that means because you have to literally make the first stitch. You have to learn how to cast on. And if someone doesn't show you how to do that, getting started doesn't really mean anything. And I feel very similarly toward writing or any sort of creative effort that it's not enough to just tell someone, oh yeah, just get started because there's a framework there that I think is really helpful for aspiring writers. So our goal is to make this process really fun, to make it very uh, guilt-free because it's all about learning and developing your skill set in a safe, supportive environment and hopefully feeling empowered once you publish to continue publishing content and to continue to write and fulfill your creative dreams. So that is the goal of our program, which is entirely online. We have a huge global community of I think almost 10,000 people now. And it's just a great, a great place to just learn really anything pertaining to writing, but especially tabletop. So that's, that's kind of the general overview. It's something that I'm really proud of and uh, just a community that I really enjoy being a part of. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, everyone be sure to check that out as well as all of Ashley's other projects, but we're not quite done yet. Let's uh, head out into the wilds and uh, look at her favorite creature. All right out here in the wilderness. Today we're going to be looking at imps. So what do you like so much about these? Okay, so I love imps. And I think (laughs) at this point, it might be somewhat well known that I love imps. So I have always loved things that are both spooky and silly. I Mm. was, was born in October. So of course, when you're, you know, October born, you always get like Halloween themed birthday parties and fun things like that. (laughs) And, uh, the nightmare before Christmas used to be like my birthday movie every year I would watch that movie. And so I just kind of always loved things that felt dark and spooky, but weren't so heavy that it made me like sad because I like when things are dark and I like, you know, dark fairy tales and dark fantasy because I feel like it really amplifies, you know, the light when there is like a positive moment or some sort of humor. And so I love imps because they really embody that to me. They're not technically, I guess they're evil, but they're evil in a way that's a little bit more like mischievous rather than flat out uh, trying to destroy your whole life. Yeah. (laughs) And so that's what I like about them. They're also tiny. And I think like tiny, scary things are delightful. And (laughs) because it's like, how can you really take it seriously when it's this little tiny devil? It's like, you know, literally a little devil on your shoulder. Yeah. And so I just think that imps are really fun because they have a pretty distinct personality and they are kind of a fun flavor that you can add to, you know, any sort of encounter. But I mostly just like that they're, they're somewhat harmless because they're so not very powerful and (laughs) but they're also fun and they really can wreak havoc if you give them the opportunity to so yeah yeah, I just I love imps they're just fun and and I like creatures that are both kind of like you know silly and mischievous um, but also you know can be persuaded depending on how you befriend them or treat them and I just think they're a lot of fun yeah, they're so flexible, which I think is a, a when we talk about creatures that are very versatile in terms of using them in your collaborative storytelling, these type of entities are great because you can take them in so many different directions and you can even plan to put them in your campaign 
for a certain purpose, but since they are so flexible, depending on how the party reacts, it can go in in a completely different direction. They're not a entity that is just, you know, some feral giant gorilla that does nothing that if it sees you, it attacks. And that's the extent of its character arc. You know, there's, there's no, Mm -hmm. there's no variety there, but there really is a lot of that with imps. And, And that is my favorite part of them as well. You know, they're, they're, it's not that they're, not nefarious in real world lore but but mm-hmm. they're they're much more associated with that mischievous aspect with with pure evil um they're originally a product of germanic folklore and they're seen of as uh, servants of more powerful beings which mm-hmm. is why they're called imps that comes from an old english word which means offshoot of a tree but essentially they are just a little devil prone to mischief and this is how I do tend to play them in my games. A, there's a little bit of a discrepancy with D&D's official monster manual description because to me, while it's a little ambiguous, they come across as a little bit more evil than mm-hmm. I prefer to think of them as. They kind of just come across as little and weak, yes, and and bumbling, yes. Um, it even says in in their description that they can't be relied on to carry out tasks with any speed or efficiency, but they they are lawful evil, like every every devil. They are classified as a devil, uh, uh, originally a denizen of the nine hills, but they they do come across to me as as just slightly more evil than I prefer to play them because I just really love that almost jovial evil aspect of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. And I rarely play them as fully evil when I use them in my campaigns. And I... I agree that I think that they would be better as probably chaotic neutral rather than lawful evil because mm-hmm. I think there's definitely a chaotic energy to imps. Uh, just mm-hmm. being impish and mischievous by nature is very much like chaotic energy. So sure. I, yeah, I agree. And I think it's just a matter of how you're using them in your games and stories because uh, I have a, a character that is like my beloved D&D character that I play who's a warlock and she has an imp familiar, but she is not evil whatsoever. Like her and neither is her imp. Her imp basically listens to her and whatever she needs to do. I mean, he's he's a trickster, but he's not really out there to, uh, you know, ruin any of her efforts to do something. And so I think it's just a matter of how you want to use them. And of course, they are devilish, they are fiendish, but I don't think that necessarily means that they have to be evil because what I like about a lot of the fiends is that they're clever. And I think it's really fun to negotiate or bribe or, you know, kind of deal with these fiends in ways other than just, you know, flat out combat, which is something that I enjoyed about Descent to Avernus uh, because you have the opportunity to kind of make deals with devils. And I think that's really fun. So yeah, I, I agree with you on imps that I think that their evil portrayal isn't a hundred percent accurate although i kind of understand why they you know assign them with that alignment because it fits with the other lore but in general i just kind of play them more as like yeah they're just they're just mischievous they're just getting into nonsense and they're making things a little bit more difficult for you and if you bring one on a heist they might try to do something to make noise or (laughs) ruin your chances but they're not out (laughs) to like kill kill you either like they can be helpful and befriended if you make the right offer to them yeah, it almost seems to me, and it's hard to do this because of, you know, their connections with devilish uh, mythology in traditional folklore, but it almost seems to me like they'd be better served as, uh, yes, fiendish creatures, you know, classified as a, a fiend, something, a being from the lower planes, but not explicitly classified as a devil or a demon, mm-hmm. um, because while they can serve those, they don't necessarily have to be explicitly devilish because devil in D&D has a very specific connotation and meaning where, you know, they are trying to corrupt you. And, and that is not the way that I, I enjoy playing imps in my collaborative stories. I think of them almost more like the lower plane reflection of fairy dragons 
mm-hmm. which is, you know, f- fairy dragons being the butterfly wing cat sized dragon that lives in the Feywild, you know, that is just, just loves playing pranks on you and, you know, giggles all the time. They're that for the lower planes. Mm-hmm. That's how I think they're, they're a great asset to any story. Just throwing that in there will add such levity, but also add in a decent amount of seriousness in terms of the different things that it can do. It, they're great for, for stories. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I've used imps many, many times in both my published work and in the campaigns that I run for my friends. At this point, it's kind of like a joke because they're like, oh, great. Are we going to encounter an imp here? And I'm like, well, (laughs) I guess not anymore. But I just think they're so fun because they can also speak. And so you can give them funny personalities. And Mm. yeah, I do think that they add a lot of levity to an encounter. And yeah, they're, they're just really fun. And you can put them pretty much anywhere. And I've been using them in my Dragon Heist campaign as kind of a connection to one of the villains who is connected to Asmodeus. And so it's been mm. kind of fun using, you know, a really, really, really low level devil that the characters can encounter with as, as they are also still pretty low level, uh, but still have that connection and like, why are there imps now in Waterdeep? Mm. And so that's yeah. been kind of fun as well. Yeah. Yeah, they can be used excellently in that way is since they are such a low level the only one that's lower level is the limere which is i don't think that's ever going to really leave the nine hills that's just the clumps of flesh oozing Mm -hmm. around on on avernus or or otherwise in the nine hills you know the the lowest level one that's actually going to leave and be in the prime material is the imp and and i think that is a great way of using them that's excellent idea to have them as the first sign of something Mm -hmm. Um, And they can even be incognito for a while because getting into their their stat block, you know, they do have the shape changer feature where they can polymorph into things like ravens or spiders or or rats. They can go invisible and they actually like to sneak up behind something and hit them with their sting while they're invisible. So they can be a, a nice little sneaky aspect to to throw in something as well yeah absolutely and that's kind of how my warlock character uses her imp is to kind of scout things out and she usually has him like on her shoulder in raven form which of course is like peak warlock energy (laughs) aesthetic it's like how warlock can you possibly look you know you have to have a big raven on your shoulder and so yeah they're, they're fun because they they can be used pretty cleverly so if you you know, are using them as either enemies for your party or even as part of your party. There's a lot of fun role play there to have. Sure. And of course, as I kind of already referenced, and as we reference here on the podcast a lot, the great D&D creatures that are excellent for your storytelling are the ones which can be used in a variety of ways. And this Mm -hmm. certainly is that. Um, As a combat encounter, not going to be too difficult it's a challenge rating of one ac of 13 with 10 hit points um uh, 20 foot walking speed and a 40 foot flying speed it's got all the typical uh devilish traits like resistance to cold and and bludgeoning piercing and slashing from non-magical attacks of course immune to fire um, and then immune to being poisoned or poison damage. And of course, being able to see in darkness uh, quite readily. Mm-hmm. But apart from that, uh, you're you're just kind of have a, a standard little critter, which isn't going to pose much of a threat unless you're at a very low level and encountering them in numbers. But they are just not here for that in my opinion <laughs> they're they're here for a lot more than just rolling on a table to see which which creature is going to combat the party this week you know they're, they're here for all the really interesting role play aspects that they can bring yeah i think for low level characters imps can be a fun first encounter uh because it is 
it's relatively low stakes, but if those imps get the poison damage on you, that's pretty rough when you're like true. a level one or two character. And that if you have true. like a, a group of imps, that is even, that's actually really fun because each of the imps can have their own personality and they're each, of course, going to be trying to cause as much mischief as possible during combat. And so it becomes kind of this like challenge for the party to try to track what these different tiny creatures are doing as they are being attacked by them. So I think you can kind of uh, set up a pretty fun encounter, especially if you're in a place where the imps have a lot of, you know, environmental areas to hide behind or use for their own mischief. But uh, yeah, I I do think that for a combat encounter, they're not the most, it's definitely not the most challenging and probably the one that you don't need to be very strategic about, but (laughs) they can, they can be fun and hard depending on how, how low level your characters are. Um, That is true. But but yeah, but I think, yeah, they they really are there more for a story and progressing a story and hinting at other nefarious things that are probably lurking nearby. I always feel like you don't just like randomly see an imp. Like an imp is there because something is happening and (laughs) it's because someone told it to be there. And so that's, I think, really fun because then that kind of becomes a mystery is like, why are there imps here? Especially if you're not in the Mm. nine hells, it's like, hmm, why would a little tiny devil be here? Because they're messengers usually. So, uh, you know, whose messages are they relaying? So I think that's just really fun. Yeah. Well, I think that's about uh, enough time out here in the Nine Hells looking at imps. Uh, Let's uh, wrap up the show by heading back to the tavern and getting some refreshment. All right, we're out here in the tavern. Today's plot hook, what would you do if you rolled back time? I I wanted to use a plot hook today that was connected to Ashley's work, and I went with this one, uh, a reference to something in Icewind Dale, Rime of the Frost Maiden, the official D&D adventure, which was released last year. Not going to go into what happens in this particular module, um, but this particular thing I'm referencing is in the epilogue on page 262 of that adventure. Uh, so don't want to really spoil it for anyone. A really interesting option there, which can occur. But this concept of having time rolled back is a really interesting plot device. Uh, have you ever messed with time in any of your campaigns? A little bit. We I actually played a level 20 adventure with my uh, party once. Uh, it was called, I think, To the End of Time. It's available on Dungeon Master's Guild. It's a pretty wild, epic adventure, but it's all about time. And so as one of the mechanics in there, you have the option to like stop time. And the goal mm. is to kind of reverse time to prevent something from happening. And it just gets pretty nuts, especially at level 20, because everyone is like so overpowered at that point. <laughs> and yeah, and it was it was pretty bonkers. And it was really fun. But it, it does get a little hard because there's all of the, you know, the implications that come with altering time, which of course a lot of, you know, fantasy and science fiction explores in depth. And I don't know if anyone really has, you know, the the best answer for that, but it's like when you have the power to control something that also controls so many other people's existences, like how does that play out? How does that totally change the world? Like, does it completely break the world as it stands? And especially if more than one person can alter time, like whose time is being altered? Because Time is something that is both an abstract concept, but it's also real, usually through, you know, the aging process. And so when you get into these, you know, these ideas of a lot of different people having the ability to change time, like how, how does that work? How can you have more than one person doing that? So I think it's a really fun concept. And I think for D&D, that's one of the best parts about playing D&D is that you can explore these really weird kind of abstract concepts in a way that would be harder to do in more traditional forms of media. So mm. yeah, we've we've played around with it a little bit and <laughs> I can't 
say that I've ever used time in a game where it hasn't just gone completely off the rails, which is fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's the challenge with it, right? Cause, cause you know, there's the question of, of should you ever do this in a story where the intention is to make it reversible and then continue the same narrative? Like you have this thing where, Oh, you know, the party has gone through, they're now, you know, level eight, nine, 10, somewhere middle of, of the campaign. If you're doing, a full one to 20 campaign and you all of a sudden go into this arc where your intention is for them to go back in time fix something or or accomplish a goal or something but then there's the ar- overarching goal to get back into the the present and, and and that is when it becomes really hard to do and really hard to not go off the rails as as you say so the question of of should this ever be done when it is reversible like or should this be a a, an ending part of a campaign or a beginning part of a campaign where where characters are drawn out of a world into a world that they don't recognize and now they have to go through with this new world perhaps with the end goal eventually being to reverse the effect but with that not being the immediate focus because otherwise you end up so quickly into timey-wimey nonsense, mm-hmm. to quote Doctor <laughs> Who. The smallest thing, I know it's a joke, you know, you go back in time and you step on a butterfly and all of a sudden the dinosaurs survive. You know, the the nature of cause and effect could really happen that way. Any small alteration is like hitting a tiny domino, which hits a larger domino, which hits a larger domino, and all of a sudden there's buildings falling over. You know, there's so much that is hard to do about handling this particular plot hook um, when it comes to trying to navigate it going back and forth. But at the same time, if we want to do that, that's also part of the fun. Sure. I mean, I I think that when it comes to role play games, there's nothing that should be off the table because mm. why not explore a wild concept like this and see what happens? I do think that for storytellers or for dungeon masters that this kind of approach I think could be really fun, but it's also challenging because you really have to determine like what are the rules of your specific time reversal mechanics because i think every every story in the world that deals with time travel has kind of different rules about it slightly to kind of justify how it'll work in that particular story and so you mm-hmm. can decide for you like how does time travel and time reversal work in your world and also then raising the stakes so that the characters know that there will be an impact and some consequences from their choices in doing this and i think that once you can really establish those then you can have a lot of fun with that as as a concept. But yeah, yeah, I mean, I think why why not try it out? I think it can probably get pretty messy. Uh, but <laughs> if you are, you know, a dungeon master who really likes to delve into lore and mechanics and thinking through those kinds of things, it could be a really fun thought challenge. Sure. But yeah, I mean, I think time travel is, is always something that enthralls storytellers because there's so many implications there. Any mm-hmm. little thing that you change then does have this ripple effect because time affects everyone. And so how does that work on when you are playing, you know, a game like D&D, which is set in these different worlds? Like, does your time travel on, you know, Faerun affect the Nine Hells? Does it affect the other planes? Like, I think you could get really uh, creative with how you're playing with time. But I think it just requires really thinking through your own rules and making sure that your players also kind of understand those rules so they know what's at stake. Because I think the only downside to playing with that is that it could be kind of a crutch. Like, oh, let's just undo everything we just did and do it better, you know? And Mm. that's, I think, part of the appeal of playing D&D is dealing with the consequences of your actions, which is why there's the dice rolling mechanism that, you know, helps you uh, see how successful you are at the choices that you've made. And so there always needs to be some give and take there. You can't just necessarily do whatever you want in D&D. That's why you have dice that you're rolling to see what happens. Um, and you, your choices can only take you so far. But yeah, I don't know. I think that sounds a lot of fun. I have been thinking about trying to use some sort of time mechanic in a solo adventure that I've been working on for a while. And I'm still trying to figure out what my rules are because <laughs> it is tricky. It's definitely, a, I think, a, a more advanced uh, storytelling challenge for sure but 
yeah, no reason not to give it a try. Absolutely. No, I completely agree. I think these are just the questions and the concepts which we have to think about before we go down that road, you know, and um, in each individual situation, you know, with what you're trying to accomplish in your particular narrative, how exactly is this going to work? If if the players just start jumping back and forth, is that going to accomplish the goals that we want to accomplish? Is that going to have an an adverse effect on the story that's already being told? If it's a existing campaign, is this going to derail uh, current plot lines and and take players away from uh, key aspects, whether it's family or or other sorts of relationships uh, that they've established with NPCs in the present timeline? There's so much that is impacted whenever we actually start talking about doing something drastic like this. Mm -hmm. That is something that really has to be thought through. But hey, if it will work for your particular scenario... It's going to be a blast. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it is a challenging concept. And there are so many ways that it could and probably would go wrong. But I think that if you establish with your party, like, okay, we're going to start dealing with time in this campaign, things might get a little weird. So here's what we're all going to agree on as being part of, you know, our, our kind of home rules for this. And that also means that maybe the goals do change based off of time reversal. Because if you can reverse time, like why wouldn't you try to reduce some of the things that you've already done in your life? And so, Mm. and there could even be, you know, inter-party conflict over that. Like someone who wants to reverse time up to a certain point and someone who thinks that it should be a different point. And so I think all of that could be a lot of fun to explore as long as everyone is kind of, uh, you know, up for up for the challenge, because I think sure. as a player also tracking all of that and dealing with the consequences and fallout of certain time reversals, uh, you know, could be really cool to really explore with your character. But it also could be, you know, challenging and a lot of work as well. But I think with the with the right campaign and the right group and the right story. And I think that really applies to any campaign. I think you should always communicate with your players about not necessarily spoiling the ideas that you have for the overarching campaign, but just like saying, hey, is this a concept that you all would be excited to explore as a table? Because if so, then you know, like, okay, things are going to get weird, but they're ready for it. Whereas I think if you just spring it on them, that could be kind of uh, maybe not as fun because it would derail a lot of their current <laughs> goals. So just something <laughs> to communicate with with your players, which is always a good practice. Sure. Absolutely. Communication is so key Mm -hmm. (laughs) in life and in this particular hobby. Yes. But I think that'll just about wrap up this week's episode of Plot Hooks. Uh, Thank you very much again for joining us, Ashley. If you'd like to uh, share where people can find you on the interwebs. Yeah, thank you so much for having me and for the the thought-provoking questions. I am definitely thinking now a little bit more about time, and maybe I'll just jump in actually (laughs) using that for one of my ideas. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, But if you are interested in any of my work, you can visit my website, which is scribemind.com. The words scribe and mind smushed together. And I'm on Twitter at Ashley N. H. Warren. And those are usually the best places to find out anything that I'm working on. If you're interested in taking a course with the Storytelling Collective, you can check out all of our programs. We also have a lot of free options as well. And that's at storytellingcollective.com. And yep, that's where you can find me. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for being on. And uh, for all of you out there listening, thank you very much. Uh, We genuinely appreciate it. Be sure to check out our social media for all updates coming up for Disaster Hamsters. And uh, be sure to uh, rate and review the podcast. And we will catch you all next week. So thanks for the entire Plot Hooks team. I'm Samuel. Thanks from Matt, Mike, Steve, Dave, Zach. Becca, and of course, podcast pupper Ellie. We'll see you all again next week for another episode of Plot Hooks.